Hello, and welcome back to The Offspring Magazine, the podcast. It's Bea, and I will be hosting today's podcast. Today, I will be talking to Dr. Giulio Malavolta, who is a group leader at the MPI for Security and Privacy in Bochum and head of the Cryptography Systems Group. We talk about quantum computers. What are quantum computers? How are they different from classical computers? What are they being used for? What is the theory behind quantum computers? We also talk about cryptography and how quantum computers are used in the field of cryptography. We will also talk about the basics of cryptocurrencies, so be prepared to learn a lot. And don't worry, the conversation is not very technical, as I'm definitely no expert, and I'm also completely new to the field, so don't be discouraged from listening to this conversation. So with that, please enjoy my conversation with Giulio Malavolta. joining us today. Why don't we just start by having you introduce yourself and tell us what you do. Yeah, uh, yeah thanks for having me. Um, so I'm Giulio uh, and I currently have faculty at the Max Planck Institute for Security and Privacy in Bochum. Um, so here we, uh, I, I have a research group uh, that is working on uh, theoretical aspects of cryptography and we are uh, uh, doing research at the intersection between Photography, quantum computing, and, and other applications of, uh, yeah, of of the mathematics of cryptography. So that's yeah, that's what we're doing here. You seem quite young. So did you just just start out as an academic? What did you do uh, during your PhD and your right. postdoc? So um, I I am not as young as I look. I think I'm, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, I'm older than I, than I look. Um, so I yeah, but compared I, to you know the the normal Max Planck Society researcher, you're definitely a lot younger. I see, I see. So yeah, so I I, did, I finished my PhD in 2019 in uh, uh, FAU Erlangen Nuremberg, um, and uh, after that I was I, I did two years of postdoc. I had a fellowship at the San Jose Institute for the Theory of Computing in Berkeley, and then I stayed uh, at uh, UC Berkeley in Carnegie Mellon University at a joint appointment there. And in 2020, I joined the MPI, so the Max Planck Society, uh, as a faculty here. Yeah, and your your background, like your bachelor, was in computer science. No, I'm actually, my bachelor was in biology. So oh wait, was, what? Yeah, yeah. So a little bit of a strange. Uh, oh, this is very strange, but this is very interesting. Yeah. So you did a bachelor in biology, yeah. and then your master in bioinformatics. Right, so what is bioinformatics then? So bioinformatics, well, so this was a long time ago, so you shouldn't ask me too many questions about it. Right, okay. <laughs> but um, bioinformatics is essentially the computability aspects of biological processes and everything that surrounds uh, biology, but it has some sort of use of a computer, like statistical analysis and things. Right, right. So could I kind of compare, so I'm a chemist, mm -hmm. I do organic chemistry, but I also do like that. I use density functional theory, which is like kind of like quantum mechanical simulation of uh, atoms, basically, to kind of help predict the way my chemical reactions are going to work. Is that kind of something? I think I think si similar. -ish? I think it's related. Uh, I I don't think there is like one you know unified definition of bioinformatics. I think it's more like you know, a collection right. of. Uh, the computer science or mathematical statistical techniques that have applications in you know, anything that concerns biological processes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so master is bioinformatics and then PhD? Uh, well, then, of course, I was lacking a little bit of background in CS. Yeah. So I did another master in CS. And then I, and then I, I started my PhD in, 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 in CS. In computer science. Yeah. Was it hard to do a master's in computer science without having had done a bachelor? Um, it was a little awkward at the beginning because there was a lot of basic maybe foundational knowledge that I was lacking. Yeah. But I would say it was a little bit more work at the beginning, but once you catch up, then it was it was I would say normal hard. <laughs> like like yeah, hard yeah, for yeah, yeah. like like hard for as much as it's hard for everyone. Right, right, right. Oh that's that's so, really interesting. I 
was always actually curious about the switch, like how easy it is to switch from a, a science background to computer science. Uh, if you hadn't done a bachelor, but it seems like it is possible if you really want it. Yeah, so I, I should say that, um, that the, it was not like a, a very abrupt transition in the sense that the fact that, that that I did bioinformatics yeah. in my master's like really helped because it that you know filled a lot of yeah. gaps in my knowledge and then of course like whatever I was missing I I picked up when I did my master's in CS. Right, right. Okay, so and now we're here. And now we're here. Um, <laughs> okay, so let's start by talking about quantum computers. Let's, let's start with um, I think a lot of people actually don't know what quantum computers are. I don't even think. I would assume like fifty percent of the population doesn't even know that quantum computers are a thing. Do you do you agree with that? But about the assessment of the like market. that around that so many people don't know that quantum computers are even a thing. Yeah, I would say yes. Uh, yeah, I think I think uh, it is uh, emerging technology which yeah. is still up. It still needs to pick up a little bit of momentum with the general public. Yeah. Um, Right, so, so should I maybe say... Yeah, tell, yeah I'm just going to move the microphone closer to oh, you, sorry. actually. No, it's because I'm really loud. Okay. And so, yes, yeah, so start by explaining to us what quantum computers are. Right. So, well, um, I, I think maybe to explain what, you know, what quantum computers are, one maybe has to try to step back and think of what actually classical computers are. That's a good right. idea. Yeah, so, so uh, by the way, so one... one Kind of technical jargon that we use a lot in this area is whenever we say classical, that means non quantum, right? So when I say classical, so our phones, for our example, phone, exactly, like our phones, the iPad, our, our laptop, that yeah. it's everything classical, right? So all the, all these things that we are used to, in, in, yeah. like we are also classical human beings, we, we, we do classical yeah. things, non, yeah. they're non quantum processes, right? So that yeah. everything is non quantum, is okay, so called classical. Um, yeah, so, so what is a classical computer? Well, it's just you know, a machine that enables computation, right? Of course, that does computation automatically. Um, now, the question that, you're, that, you, that you can ask is, what's the physical process right. that enables this computation? And, you know, whatever it is in the classical computer, I don't know, I, I, I'm not an expert in, in hardware, but I presume there's some sort of transistor that, 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 yeah. that, uh, that, that is doing some computation, right? Now, now, the question that people ask with quantum computers is, can we use physical processes at the quantum atomic level to actually perform the computation itself. And uh, so I would say maybe like the one line summary is that quantum computer is a computer that sort of leverages the laws of quantum mechanics to perform computation. So we sort of hack into the, the, the quantum structure of nature and try to use this structure to perform some computation for us. And that's maybe quantum computers. Now, as for the physical implementation of quantum computers, there are different ways to do it, but we, what is important for us is the underlying mathematical model, which is always the same for, for, for all this. For every kind of quantum, quantum computer. computer. Okay. Yes. So with mathematical model, what, what exactly do you mean by that? Is that an equation or? No, so in the same way as we have a mathematical model for classical computing, which is Turing model, right? The mm -hmm. Turing machine. Right. Um, we had the same thing for quantum computers. So we have something called quantum Turing machines, or if you're more of an electrical engineering kind of person, you want to think of circuits. Mm -hmm. There is some, there is, as, as much as there are classical circuits, you know, with, with wires and switches and, 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 and logical gates, there is such a thing as quantum circuits. They work a little bit different from classical circuits, but, but you can define it. It's a well-defined mathematical model, and you can work with that. Okay, and then that that's used in quantum computers. That's what we use to uh, study and understand quantum computing, and uh, what supposedly this machine that engineers are building today will be based their computation on. Okay. Um, so you said that traditional computers. Do you know how traditional computers work? Like how exactly the transistors. I, I work there at the hardware level. Yeah. No. 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 Okay. I, we work with math, so so not 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 my area. Right. Um. And it, so it seems like quantum computers. There's still a lot of research that's going into it. How established are they? Um, quantum computers. So so I think maybe there are two 
sort of two sides to this question. So there, there is the theoretical side, which is how established is the model and how well we understand the model of quantum computing. And there is the aspect of you know what's the status of actually building a quantum computer, right? right? So, so as for the first part, there, I, I would say the model is very well understood. So it's based on you know physics that has been developed at the beginning you know, of the last century, and, it, and by now it's sort of a really well established uh, mathematical model. As for building actual quant actual quantum computers that work, well, that that's an open problem. So okay. it's uh, people are still working on that. So when you when you translate math to the real world, there are always problems, yeah. <clears throat> and sometimes you have to update the math. So yeah. far, we didn't have to do it, but it, we may need to in the future. We don't know. Was there the same kind of lag uh, for traditional computers that maybe you had the models and the math, like you say, to it, but uh, it was very hard to actually build a traditional computer or classical computer? Um, or is this something that's unique to quantum computing? So there are cer certain aspects that, that are sort of unique to quantum computers. So the, the classical model of computation was established by Turing in, in his you know, seminal paper and it hasn't changed ever since. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's still the same model. Uh, maybe people have refined it a little and so on. They build on top of it, but the basic, the basic foundations, they are still the same. Um, what what happened with uh, with with classical computer was that it was not clear so clear at the beginning the scalability of uh, uh, how how scalable this technology would be right in terms of how much computation you can do with a computer. Mm -hmm. But during the process of building computers, um, there has been a lot a series of technological breakthrough, like for example the invention of the invention of the transistor. Of Integrated yeah. circuits and this kind of you know, uh, hardware breakthrough that allowed to really scale the classical computer to to an extent which people did not expect maybe uh, fifty years ago. Um, so it's, it's it's actually very hard to predict mm. how how the process will go, uh, how the progress will go, and we we could expect the same to happen for quantum computers. Um, maybe one difference with respect to the uh, classical computer is that we don't expect in classical computer we didn't expect anything to go wrong with the physics here we are touching upon upon the you know very foundational principles of physics which are also at the interface be between things that we don't really understand well so for example how the classical world yeah interacts with the quantum world this is right. something we don't understand very well right um, just, I feel like we haven't defined it, and I know it's very hard to define, but can you try to define the quantum world, like what it means to work at a quantum level? A quantum level, yeah. right. So, so this is actually, you know, defining the difference between what is classical and what is quantum, it's a very difficult question. Yeah. Um, and especially, you know, having a theory that unifies these two, uh, these two notions, it's an open problem in physics, so we, we don't really have a good answer for that. Um, but what I can say is that um, the, there is a theory, there are two different theories that apply depending on which world you live in. So if I live in the classical world, there is the theory of classical mechanics, of general relativity, right? That these are things that, that maybe on a smaller scale, just Newtonian mechanics is what we see every day, right? Um, Whereas if you go on a, on, a, on a microscopic scale, then there's a different set of rules that apply, and particles and, 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 and you know, entities behave in a different way. So, um, you know, you may ask, when does something stop being quantum and starts becoming mm -hmm. classical? That's a difficult question that, that I don't know how to answer. Yeah. I don't think anybody knows how to answer. Yeah. Um, but uh, maybe the definition of something Classical versus something quantum is whether this object, this body, is behaving according to the laws of classical mechanics or the laws of quantum mechanics. Yeah. And uh, um, again, like all of our classical computers, they all obey the law of classical mechanics, so there's very little interaction with quantum mechanics. Whereas 
With quantum computers, we are really hoping to use those interactions in a in a productive sense. That's that's maybe. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So why did we want to build quantum computers? So what's the reason? What was the original motivation, or what's the motivation? Well, I guess if the if there's been a change between the original motivation and now, then it'd be interesting to know how that right. has evolved. Right. Right. So so I think the question started. Well. Uh, I hope I'm not saying anything wrong, but I, I think the question really started with the physicist Richard Feynman, that just, you know, maybe out of intellectual curiosity asked, well, can we actually, you know, uh, um, um, construct computers that use quantum subatomic rules to do the computation? And I think the, the reason why he was mostly interested in is to do things like simulation of quantum processes. It, when you want to simulate a quantum process on a, on, a, on, a, on a computer, it's probably not that, not that unintuitive to, un to understand that a quantum computer will be better than this, just because it's actually running this process inside of the machine rather than sort of trying to... Right. Can, I, can I ask you actually a question related to that? Then we'll go back to talking yes, about yes, yes. why we developed quantum computers. But again, back to my chemistry um, and using density functional theory, like I study the, the electrons mm -hmm. and how they interact in a molecule or with mm -hmm. atoms. Like, mm -hmm. Would that then be better to study on a quantum computer? I, I, I'm not sure, but uh, yeah. I think that some of these processes, which are the processes which are inherently quantum mechanical... Right. It's all better to study on a quantum computer. Well, again, you have to look at the, sp the specific process. Not, mm -hmm. It's not true for all of them, but yeah. uh, so for some of them, we don't know any better way than just sort of reproduce this process in a you know, really quantum sense rather than just building a classical model that sort of reproduces the statistics that we can get out mm -hmm. of this process. So that's... Okay, so, I see. And that, I think, was the original motivation for, the, okay. for, for building, building quantum computers. Of course... Just to be able to study processes that happen at a quantum level. Right. So, I mean, again, this is... I'm not a chemist, I'm not a... I mean, maybe in a previous life, life I used to be a biologist, <laughs> not anymore. But I don't know what people care about. But yeah. people do care about simulating, simulating these processes because you know we want to know it. Right. And uh, the best way, in fact, the only way we know how to do it is just to, you know, really reproduce them on a, on a small atomic level, yeah. and that's exactly you know what, what quantum computers. So quantum computers were. Yeah, mainly used for like research, developed well, for research purposes, and. Yeah. Well, so again. Maybe let me stress that this is all theoretical, so nothing right. was built at that time. So right, there right. was no quantum computer, nothing. It was just you know an idea. Yeah. Um, and then people started sort of. Sorry, and when was this r r roughly oh, time scale? Oh, don't, don't ask me. I think okay. I think it was. Uh, I don't know. It was maybe after after the Second World War. Yeah. So maybe. late nineteen hundred. Yeah, late late nineteen hundred. Like, before like before the the nineties. So right. Okay. I think it, the nineties have sort of seen maybe that I'll get I'll get into into this now, but they yeah. sort of seen like a resurgence of uh, you know, new applications and, and classical computers. When were they developed? <laughs> if you don't know, don't <laughs> worry. Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, I, I forget. I mean, you know, the, the, the classical computers were, were the, the work of Turing was done. Uh, like during the Second World War. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well. It, well, maybe not. But before, but yeah, yeah right before that. And yeah. So I would say we've seen the the, the development throughout the, the, the yeah okay the twentieth century. Yeah. Um, Sorry, yeah. I've completely ruined your trail of thought now. But uh, no worries, no worries. I, mean, I forget. I forget. No. Words. Yeah. So 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 back to why we wanted to even start developing quantum mm -hmm. computers, and I guess the origin, one of the purposes, was to study things that are at a quantum level. That, that is correct, yeah, yeah. So, and again, like maybe, of course, in retrospect, it's easy to say, but it, it, it makes sense, right? That it's, not, yeah. it's not really surprising that we would be better at simulating quantum processes by using an actual quantum hardware, right? That, that makes sense. It makes right? complete sense. Good. So, so, so that's, that's, people, that's what people say, okay, you know, can, can you do this? Um, and then for a while, there was not a lot of development, also because it was not, not so clear what you know? What other usages we would have for this kind of machines? Um, but uh, in the nineties, there was a huge 
breakthrough in quantum computing. So people started taking quantum computing a little bit more seriously. Also, people that don't care about you know simulating quantum processes, simulating chemists, and 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 they are just interested in computation by itself. Um, so, and what end, what ended up happening? Why the reason why people um, got suddenly very interested in this technology was because we discovered that there are some problems which have nothing to do with simulating quantum processes that quantum computers can solve much, 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 much faster than classical ah, computers. Okay. And uh, those are problems that, that, that we do care about. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, for people like myself whose primary interest is studying, you know, computation, the nature of computation, the mathematics of computation, when you have such a gap, when you see a separation between these two models of computation, it's a sign that something is happening mm. in that computational model, so you need to go there and understand what's going on. Again, like this is all theoretical work, so, yeah. so far no, no machine has been built at, at this point in time, and so just theoretical work, but just understanding, understanding what quantum computers can do. Yeah. I can I can say what these problems are. If, uh, yeah, go. That's good. that's curious. That I'm curious about. Okay. That, yeah. Okay. So so there are. I'm oversimplifying a lot. I'm hoping I'm, I'm not offending any of my colleagues. Right. I know that <laughs> that that's a huge problem when you try to oversimplify. You also don't want to be you know I don't know misrepresenting. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, I think it's undeniable to say that the sort of most important development of quantum computers is the development of Schwarz algorithm to factor integers. So this is just a mathematical problem uh, and uh, it's a very simple problem. So I'm giving you a large integer, just it can be as large as you want, and now you have to decompose it into its prime factors. Um, so every integer is as a unique decomposition into prime factors and um, so if you think of this as a function, here you have the prime factors and here you have the products, which is this integer. You can think of this function going two ways. You can go from here to here, mm -hmm. right? So that's that's just very easy to compute because it's a multiplication, right? You yeah. just multiply, it's, that's very easy to do. We know how to do it very fast. Yeah. But from going to here to here, if you don't know this factor, it's very difficult. Yeah. And. Um, and uh, it's so difficult that people actually build cryptography out of it. So that's, uh -huh. that's why, that's why uh, uh, um, you know, it was such a shock when, they, when Peter Shore came up with this algorithm that actually showed how to do this inversion process efficiently, quote, efficiently in quotes, yeah. on a quantum computer. And that was uh, very unexpected. Okay. And the reason was that this is actually a problem that has nothing to do with quantum computation. This yeah. has nothing to do with physics. It is a pure mathematical problem. And you know the reason why is even more shocking is that essentially all of the cryptographic systems that we use today they rely on this problem being hard. Right. So mm -hmm. so you know that's that's a little bit of a of an issue. Right. And that sort of kickstarted the, the you know. Okay. What's cryptography? What's cryptography? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Good, 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 good. So, so cryptography is a branch of computer science, is a branch of theoretical computer science, and it is essentially, maybe in a sentence, cryptography is the mathematics of computer security. So if you want to keep data secure, you want to communicate securely, mm -hmm. you need a mathematical foundation for doing that, that's what cryptography is. Okay. It studies these kind of problems. Can you give me an example? Right. Um, what would be an easy example? Well, you know, I want to, for example, securely communicate some data to you, but I don't want anybody to uh, uh, know what, I'm, what, yeah. what these data are. Uh, so the you know, tool that cryptography gives you is so-called an encryption scheme. So I can encrypt data oh, with, okay. with respect mm -hmm. to, your, mm -hmm. to some key that you possess. And unless someone steals this key from you, they cannot understand anything about the data that I sent you. It's just encrypted. It's but I have the key. If you have the key. So if you're sending me encrypted information, I can decrypt it with my key. That's correct. You can recover the original. And that's all. So this decryption, encryption, is all based on mathematics. That's all based on mathematics. 
case. And that's what you studied, the mathematics of, of this correct. encryption and decryption. That's correct. It's not always the same mathematics, it can be different. Yeah, it has to be different. I have such a hard time understanding how like math is used for, for the, so it's like equations in math or... Um, right, so in fact it's not, not so, I mean of course there are equations, but well, um, what we really use from math is precisely these kind of problems that I was saying before. So some problems which are hard to compute. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that's what makes your encryption scheme hard to break. Okay. Right. So, so it's maybe it's not it's not very precise what I'm saying, but uh, the idea is the following. You know, if someone, if I'm sending you this ciphertext and you don't have the key, right? You know, how can I guarantee that that you will not be able to recover the information? Yeah. I mean, the information is there. Right, but, yeah. but you don't know, you don't know the key, so you cannot recover it. And the, you know, the, the, the base principle of modern cryptography is the following. If you, as an attacker, were able to actually break my cryptographic system, then it must be the case that you're solving an hard underlying mathematical problem. Mm -hmm. And, for example, like factoring and th we believe that those problems are hard. Okay, factory is not a great example, because <laughs> you say it was easy, but like, there are other problems. Yeah, yeah, I get what you mean. So that's essentially how, how this discipline works. Right, but how, it, like, if I possess the key, how do you prevent yes. a hacker not from hacking my key? So that's a different, uh, oh. that's a different problem, right? Of course, okay. so if you were, you know, so cryptography operates in a, in a, in a communication model, and the guarantees of cryptographic schemes go only up to where it's possible to protect information. Of course, if you were to publish your encryption, your decryption key, there's right. nothing that cryptography can do for right. you. Right, right. And now then the questions of, uh, you know, how do you actually keep your keys secret? You can also, you know, you can also make cryptography which is more convenient to store and so on, but ultimately, you know, that's not a mathematical problem, that's a physical problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you so if you build the mathematics, let's say for the encryption decryption, yeah. then you surely want to try to design it in a way that's very hard to solve, so that right. hackers can't access it, right? That, that is correct. But um, you're always you always have to work in a model where things are possible. So, okay. for example, if if I were working in a in a mathematical model where all the parties would just publish their secret key, that there's just nothing we can do. Yeah. We can prove it. We can prove that there is nothing we can do in that yeah. particular model. So we have to adopt models which are realistic and reasonable. So you know we can sort of keep some information secret, but at the same time they enable us to communicate securely. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, very abstract. This, but but it's very abstract. But but there is a. There it's is just hard. It's just very abstract because I can't. It's hard to imagine. Um. Like it, it, yeah. It's you know sometimes like when you can see the process physically, mm -hmm. it's just a lot easier to understand it. And this is why I think quantum mechanics is also so hard to understand because you it's so abstract. Yeah, you can't really picture it. Yes, that that is correct. So I, I forget who 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 this citation is from, but like someone I maybe from Neumann was saying that you know you. You don't understand math, but, but you get used to it. Okay. So, so you know, I really like this sentence because it's really true. Like, like the, at the moment you, you work with these models, and eventually you get used to them. Yeah. And you get you start thinking in terms of this model, and and this is true for classical computing. You have to sort of get used to, to reasoning in that sense, yeah. and it's also true for quantum computing. You have to get used to reasoning. Yeah. In that sense. So when you develop um, the math or the models for this encryption decryption. Yeah. Where where do you do that? Like you, yeah, do it on the computer, oh, or is so there like what kind of program do you use? How do you do this? Like on, a, on a very practical, yeah, on paper, just so, on paper. Yeah, yeah, on paper. We start on paper. Yeah, this is this is this the, the nice thing of this of you know mathematics, theoretical yeah. computer science that you can work on paper. So you don't use like coding or anything. No, so so it depends. So the question is, you know. Of course, what you write on paper needs to needs be, to be yeah. needs to be implementable. Yeah. 
Uh, now, for the algorithms that we can implement, we will implement them, and we will really want to see that they actually work. Like, yeah. But that's maybe you can think of it as the a, a more experimental kind of work, which we do with Legos yeah. and stuff. Um, but not not all algorithms that we develop we can implement. For example, quantum algorithms typically we cannot implement. We just don't have the hardware for them. Wait, there are quantum algorithms? Well, the same way as classical algorithms. Okay, but then they just work or focus on the quantum at a quantum level. Right. So maybe maybe you know I'm not making that much of a distinction between quantum computation and quantum algorithms. So maybe that's that's maybe it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Okay. Oh right, right. Okay. So, so okay. That makes sense now. Uh, okay. So, yeah, sorry. It, it, so I completely sidetracked us now. So we've talked a little bit about cryptography, and we can talk more about the use of cryptography. I just did want to try to bring it back to the quantum computing. Yes. Um, now I need to think back, actually, to where we were, and I just lost my trail of thought. I think we were saying about... Um, oh, right. Quant right. Quantum computers can be used um, for the... Like, the for the cryptography, basically, right? To do this process well, I mean, faster. actually, they can use break cryptography. To, oh, to break, okay. Yeah, so as I, as I was saying earlier, um, you know, you can factor integers um, yeah. in, in, I want to say exponentially faster, that's maybe would be, or sub-exponentially faster would be the technical term, but like, let me just think of it as much, much, much faster mm -hmm. um, than classical computers. And that's a problem for cryptographers, or well, it used to be a problem, because, you know, the security of our information relies on this problem being intractable, being hard. Yeah. And now someone is coming and saying, it's not hard. They say, hmm, what are we doing, right? So it's, it's a, little, a little bit of a shock. Oh, so nobody, of course, again, let me stress, at that point in time, in the 90s, there was no such thing as a quantum computer, so nobody could actually run this algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it was there, it was theoretically, theoretically developed, okay. people, you know. And then the development started, probably, because people were like, wait, if I can just use a quantum computer to make right. my life easier, why don't I develop one? Well, I mean, there, were two, there are, I think, two, two, two sides of this question. Of course, there is the more practical side, the more experimental side. I say, okay, you know, let, let's build it. Let, let's see if, it's, if this thing is even possible, right? So, yeah. you know, we have all these mathematical models, but sometimes yeah. we have to update them, right? Yeah. And uh, is it, like, then people ask, is this, do we have to update this, or is it, is it still correct? So let's build it. Let's build a machine. So that was, you know, of course, it motivated a lot yeah. of this. But, like, on, also on the other side, like, it, it really motivated people to say, okay, you know, there is something happening in this quantum computing. Let's try to understand what are the limits of quantum computing, what kind of problems we can actually solve faster than classical computing. Right. And that's... And all of those problems you can only figure out once you've actually built the machine, right? No, no, you can study them theoretically. Oh, you can also study yeah, yeah, yeah. them. So that, that's, that's how research in quantum computing, quantum algorithms is done. I yeah. would say even up to today, like people, are, they start by studying a, an algorithm mm -hmm. on a theoretical level, and then they see what they can sort of implement yeah, in a yeah. real machine. Okay, so what are then some like limitations to quantum computers that maybe, I don't know, traditional computers can do better or... Right, so, good. Um, again, we, in terms of, so again, we have to separate two sides of this question. Yeah. So there is a theoretical, <laughs> Yeah. side of this question, and uh, there is a practical, the practical one. So which one do you start? I don't care, okay. but I want to know both. <laughs> oh, good. So the theoretical answer is no. Actually, there is no quantum computers are strictly better than classical computers. In every single case. Well, in a sense that... So let's take my phone, because yes. there's a transistor in my phone, yes. right? Yes, yes. So could a quantum yeah. computer base, like, in, I, I know, prove my phone? Any computation that is happening on your phone can, in principle, in, yeah, 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 in principle, theoretically, be, yeah, yeah, okay, be simulated by a quantum computer. Okay, I see. The other side, not so clear. We believe not. Okay. But we don't have a proof. So. So what, why do you believe? Because not. We, we believe as a community that that 
that quantum computers can solve some problems faster than classical computers because there are problems because there are problems that for which this is the case at least yeah. in terms of the best algorithms that we know yeah so for example factoring yeah it's not the only one there are other problems but I mean, I'll keep referring to this sure um, so if we don't know how to solve how to factor integers fast on a mm -hmm. classical machine but we do know how to do it on a quantum machine yeah and let me stress this is not not for lack of trying people try really 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 hard to factor numbers so imagine there's using really, classical, using computers, classical yeah. computers like really okay. hard really really yeah. hard and uh, you know imagine if you could do that you could just enter into all bank accounts of the world so there is really also a lot of incentives to do that right? oh yeah so okay. so you see the, yeah maybe i'm oversimplifying but 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 that's, clearly everything's been tried <laughs> everything we, we, we could yeah, yeah at yeah. this point yeah you know you never know yeah right? but um and uh, but for quantum computers in principle we know that they can solve this problem okay in reasonable amounts of time yeah, 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 yeah. But so, um, like, will our phones be using quantum so, well, computers in the future? <laughs> well, that's the practical side. Of yeah. This. And that's, yeah, as I said before, actually understanding, you know, actually building a quantum computer, that's an open problem. We, we, right. don't, we, don't, we don't really have a scalable quantum computer at the moment. We really have just very, very small, well, machines that are capable of very, very small computations. So what are quantum... Like, are there some applications in society right now that we use in day-to-day -day life where quantum computers are used or will likely be used in the future? So, so there are applications for which quantum computers are useful. Um, I don't know to which extent they are used on a large scale, yeah. not that I personally will ask. Um, but uh, there are applications for which they can they can be used um, and uh, for example so one thing that quantum computers would allow is something called certifiable randomness so there's I could do something like so randomness is very useful in general in computation and cryptography and so mm -hmm. on now if I'm giving you a string and I tell you oh this string was random why would you believe me maybe I just cook it up myself yeah right? so and classically you cannot Prove that something was random. That's just, <clears throat> just it's an easy theorem to prove. That there's no such thing as certifiable randomness. But using the process of quantum mechanics, it turns out that you can you can prove that you sampled something randomly without without really, really you trying to bias the outcome. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's something useful. Like randomness is something extremely useful um, for both cryptographic systems and, and, and society at large. Imagine, I mean, random, randomness can just be, you know, the output, the outcome of a lottery, right? Yeah. Um, um, hmm. That's just, you know, how, how, how do I make sure that the person who is drawing the number is actually drawing them at random? In principle, quantum computers allow you to actually certify that. Yeah. In, a, in an unequivocal sense. So that's, that's one application. Um, other applications that we have with quantum computers you know, just from the top of my head, you can prove that you actually deleted data. Oh, that's so. That's so yeah, yeah. It, again, that's not something you can do classically. Uh, so, can you give me an example of like where I would want to delete my data? So I don't know. Take Google. Like, if I want to delete something from Google. Right. So, so you, for example, you have a photo. Okay. So, yeah. So let, let me just give you an example, which is just impossible, but let's and then yeah. we'll work out. On, we'll work out how how to do this. So let's say you have a photo that you uploaded on Google, I don't know, 10 years ago, and yeah. now you, you're not very comfortable with it for whatever yeah. reason you want to just get to delete. Yeah. And then, you know, this is a very, very simple scenario. You can abstract it away. You can just ask, you know, to a server, could you please delete yeah. that picture? And now the server say, okay, yeah, delete it. How do you know that they deleted exactly. it, right? Exactly, exactly. And uh, in fact, you cannot, right? It, it, there is always, a, there is always, Imagine, you know, you have a message, I can always take a picture of my phone. Whatever is happening mm -hmm. in this phone, I can never be sure that nobody deleted, that someone, that someone deleted actually the content, yeah. because I could have just taken a picture of it, right? Yeah. So, it's just, maybe this is the intuition, you can, you can, you can make it formal, 
Yeah. But this is the intuition, and that's the reason why classically. You just can't prove. You just can't prove. This is just impossible. Now it turns out that if you use quantum information, you actually can prove that you deleted something. Um, now, of course, the catch is that the object that you're trying to delete has to be a quantum state. It cannot be. It's to be like encoded in in some yeah. quantum process and sort of the microscopic yeah. level. And so that's maybe a you know a little bit of a technological challenge to do. Yeah. But at least it's telling you that in principle there is something that we can do. Uh, with quantum computers that we cannot do with classical computers. Okay. And this is something we can prove. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. I still don't fully understand why a quantum computer can do that and a classical computer cannot. Right. But I guess that's just... So, so maybe the key words is the... Um, again, I'm, I, w- I want the time to explain it in a precise sense, but maybe the key words that you may have heard of the uncertainty principle. Yeah, Good. yes. So, you know, you cannot know... There are two quantities that you cannot know at the same time. Yeah. And, you, know, you can make this concept precise. These are, you know, called anti-commuting observables, whatever. And uh, you can use classically. There is no such thing, right? If you, you know, objects are unique, uniquely determined. If you look at the object, you know where it is. Yeah. And so all quantities are, um, you know, fully determined. Quantumly, there is no such thing. So. The idea is to sort of leverage this uncertainty principle to encode data. So if you knew some information about the data, then by the uncertainty principle, some other information must be lost. Mm-hmm. That's very, right. very vague, really. Yeah, that yeah. That's why right, this right. works. Right. Um, in the future, mm-hmm. I know it's very hard to predict the future. Yes. In 100 years' time, how many applications will be done with quantum computers? Good question, good question. So, like, do you think quantum computers will surpass classical computers? I don't think people are thinking as these two technologies sort of competing. So um, one won't replace the other. So quantum computers won't replace yeah, traditional uh, or classical computers in every sense. I think, I think, I think, yeah, you know, I think it's not a very useful distinction to make. It, you know, there's also th- classical things that are happening inside of a quantum computer. So yeah. it's not so clear where the where, where you draw the line, right? So so then you know let's say you have a computer that is doing some classical process and some some quantum process on the side. Would you call that computer classical or quantum? I think mm-hmm. I think I think people are not so much thinking of these two as competing approaches, but really what are the powers of quantum computation that we can actually yeah. leverage in our society. Now there are some tasks for which quantum computers appear not to be useful at all. What are what are some of these tasks? Well, for example, you know, uh, like everything that uh, that that doesn't require, you know, this speed up in computation. For example, okay. there are things that we know we know perfectly well how to do, like uh, you know, streaming a video. Yeah. That why would you? There, use there there is no apparent reason now. Okay, maybe in two years someone comes up with this. I don't know, but uh, but uh, at the moment there is no yeah, apparent reason I see, I see, to, to use a, to use a quantum computer. Yeah. Computer. Just one example. Okay. Or, um, um, yeah, so in general, anything that doesn't, doesn't use any, that doesn't use any sophisticated mm-hmm. physical process. Simple stuff, or, yeah. Or these kind of things. Why, why more, use quantum computers for that, yeah. Happy to be proven wrong. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, of course. But, uh, Okay, so we shouldn't see them as one replacing the other, but rather trying to find ways in which quantum computing right. can help, right. it, I don't know, enhance what we do yeah, and yeah, exactly. how we use it. So, okay, yeah. So maybe the, the other side of the question is, like, is it realistic that we will have quantum computers in our pockets? Yeah. This I don't know. Uh, it's, I think it's very hard to predict. It seems... It seems completely unrealistic at this point in time, but then again, 50 years ago, it felt completely unrealistic to have these gigantic computing machines in our pockets. Yeah. Who knows, right? Is the computational power of quantum computers a lot higher than classical computers? Yeah, so again, the computational power, I'm not sure what you mean by that. So, so like, is it just like a lot slower to run things with quantum computers or faster? 
Um, it's just a different... Like, d yeah, okay. It's just a different way of doing the computation. Okay. Maybe what I can say is that um, the condition under which quantum computation becomes possible and interesting are much more, quote-unquote, extreme than the usual condition where we do mm -hmm. classical computation, right? So, so the thing is, um, the thing is, uh, you know, classical computation is something we can do in, you know, at room temperature if this world and, and exactly, and, yeah, and nothing, nothing would happen. Whereas, um, you need very special condition for process to maintain what we call their quantum state. Yeah, it's, it's also called their coherent state. You know, you yeah. ask me the, the technical jargon. You need, re you need really special conditions that are very delicate and uh, uh, pretty, pretty challenging to reproduce in a lab environment at present. Okay. Uh, but that's what people are working on, that's what physicists yeah. and engineers are, are, are studying to, okay. to make this, this, this kind of process yeah. more robust to you know, the environmental noise, quote unquote. Um, and we move from classical computers to quantum computers. Is there something after quantum computers? Or because we're already like, you know, at, at kind of the electron quantum level, like there's nothing after that? That's actually a very good question. And that's something that, that uh, people did study, surprisingly. It's not, oh. it's not so, you may think it's like a completely insane question. It's not, yeah. right? it's, it's something that people did study. Um, so the thing is, in terms of computation, in terms of mathematics, you can define a model that you want, right? Yeah. Now the question is, does this model correspond to a physical, physically realizable principle or not, yeah. right? And uh, so far we haven't found any other model of computation that would correspond to something that we can hope to implement yeah. as a physical machine, right? So the classical model of computation, we know we can implement it, you know, those are computer, smartphone, whatever. Quantum computation, you know, we, we know we know the laws of physics, yeah. we presume that, that they work as advertised and and then you know if that's if everything goes through we can build a quantum computer. We don't know of any other uh, model to the best of my knowledge. Yeah. But but again like that that, that didn't... it's so hard to predict the future though so like it could be coming. I was just you know Curious whether there were already some ideas out there, whether Look, there was something after or not. Yeah, people tried all sorts of crazy things. I mean, you yeah. can even, you can even, this is like a pretty, this is a serious topic of, of study. You can even study, you know, what would my computational power if I had access to a time machine. Oh and my gosh, <laughs> that's actually like an actual question. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You, can, <sighs> you, can, you can study this as a formal model yeah. and you can show results. In, no. in the computational results in, yeah, this, yeah, yeah. in this model, um, but of course. So on the theoretical level, just so much is possible. You can, you can study whatever, anything. You can basically. do whatever you want. Now, of course, the, the question that you should ask yourself is whether you should study. This yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and I think I think you know that's our job to understand uh, um, whether it's you know an interesting model or not, uh, but. But maybe what I can say is that maybe not all models which are... So there, there is a value in studying models even though they are not physically realizable. Just for our understanding. Um, yeah. Um, so, so people, yeah, just maybe just, just to give the, the general sense that people really studied a lot of yeah. these models. But at, at, to the best of my knowledge, the only sort of two reasonable models of computation that we know how to actually implement the quantum computing and the classical computing. Model. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so let's go back all the way to the first question I asked, which was like, what, what do you research? So tell me again now what you research specifically, um, just so that, to see if it makes more sense now that we've talked about sure. quantum computers. Um, right, so, so my, I mean, I think I mentioned this earlier, but like my research is centered around the discipline of cryptography. So yeah. I, I did. That's, so that, that, that's what I'm trained for. Um, but th as I mentioned also earlier, cryptography and quantum computing, they have a lot of interaction between each other. Right, just because cryptography is done better with quantum computers. Uh, well, it, better and worse. Like, it's, oh. not, it's not so... so oh. For example, we, 
you, you know, we cannot use some hard problems in quantum, in quantum cryptography because they're not hard. Okay. <laughs> so okay. so that, that's, yeah. that's one problem. I mean, of course, the other side is that you can hope to use all these um, physical quirks of quantum mechanics to do better cryptography or cryptography that is just not possible otherwise. Yeah. Um, and another question that people, well, other questions that people study are things like, for example, you know, can a classical machine verify a quantum computation? So just mm. be convinced that the quantum computation was done correctly, although you don't have you know, access to a quantum uh, machine, it turns, yeah. out, turns out you can. Um, another, yet another question is about, you know, the foundation of cryptography. For example, um, if we want to protect our data, if we want to, you know, build cryptographic systems that are secure against quantum adversaries, how do we develop a mathematical model that allows us to reason formally about that? Mm -hmm. So that's a non-trivial, absolutely non -trivial tasks that people have studied, okay. especially in the recent years, quite a lot. That's all these all these sort of questions are questions that are really at the intersection between these two disciplines. You need to uh, be talking about cryptography in the sense that you are really working in the domain of cryptography, but ultimately the language that you are using in your proofs, in your theorem, is a quantum language because you are also talking yeah. about processes. Right. Okay, so so that that makes a lot of sense to me. Also, now how how they're how they're connected, and so why exactly is cryptography so important to study? I mean, you've already given a few examples. Right. Um, do you want us to talk more specifically about maybe one that you are most interested in? Uh, right. So so I mean, you know, cryptography, crypto. There's you know there are a lot of societal implications of cryptography. I'm, exactly, I'm, I'm a, I'm a seems simple, like it. Yeah, I'm a simple person, so so you know like my the implication that I see from cryptography is that I don't have to go to the bank to do a bank transfer, and I really like not not yeah. queuing up for 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 doing bank transfer. I don't have to go to the post office. To yeah, pay things because you can. I can just transfer it directly yeah, to you. Yeah, securely. Right? Securely. So that's you know, the and only you have my the key to access it. There so, you go. Right. Okay. So all these sorts of things we. We can already do because we have cryptography. Otherwise, yeah. it would it would be the sort of good old yeah good old days where you have to go physically to the place. And, and yeah, yeah. So cryptography is related to cryptocurrencies just because cryptocurrency relies on cryptography. Otherwise, they wouldn't work. Right. 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 So so I'm thinking I'm thinking of um, so cryptocurrency is so maybe maybe the, the thing that I was just alluding Sorry. at. Now it was not cryptocurrency. It was yeah, really sorry. Just, just sorry, sorry, sorry. But but, uh, but yes, yes. Of course, cryptocurrencies are. are no, sorry, I didn't want to lead you <laughs> sidetrack. It's just I was just like, oh my gosh, it makes so much sense now. But um, keep going with your with what you were saying for applications. Right, right. So so so. Or why you study cryptography specifically? So well, okay. I don't study it particularly for the application. I study it because you know of essentially curiosity, like you want to really understand what's going on, you really want to understand why things, like how, where does the sort of hardness come from, like, like you know, we, have, we say that there are problems that are hard, why yeah. are they hard, how do we yeah. use them, that's, that's you know, yeah. those are very fascinating questions that, that, uh, that I'm studying and that's the reason why I'm studying, and maybe not, I'm not so concerned about, uh, 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 you know, like what can we actually do from it, but like maybe from the more foundational level. That's mm -hmm. why I'm curious about it. Um, but it turns out, of course, that, that whatever we are doing, it does have implications. Uh, and so you have to also worry about that once, once, once you build something that, that, um, that uh, yeah. But that's maybe not so much what motivates me. Let me put it this right, way. Right, right. Um, and there are, you know, so one, one very fascinating aspect about cryptography is that, um, so there are things that our intuition would say that they are impossible. And it turns out that most of the time, well not most of the time, but many, many times just our intuition is wrong. And cryptography gives you a way to to sort of do these things that, that your intuition tells you is just not possible. For example, there is one one, you know, not so recent anymore, but like one of the, the sort of most important topics in the last two decades is computing on encrypted data. So let's say I'm giving you a so a, we call it a ciphertext, it's an encryption mm -hmm. of some, some data. And now I'm asking you, well, just please compute a function over the data.
you tell me. But I'm not telling you what the secret key is. So you cannot be tricked with side effects. Okay. How would you do that, right? So it turns out that there is a way for you to sort of manipulate this side effects without actually knowing what's inside and then, you know, compute uh, the output of some function of your data. In fact, any function that you want. Um, again, this intuitively sounds strange because you say, well, how can I compute on something if I don't know what this yeah. something is? It turns out that our intuition is just wrong. You can do it. And that's what cryptography allows you to do. Um, and, you know, there is a very specific mathematical structure that you can use to solve this particular problem. So that's, that's just one example, yeah. by the way. There's this pool of this, this kind of... What, what would be an example, though, where you, you want to encrypt the cipher code, the cipher text, basically? Right, so for example, like a real-life example? Yeah. So, you know, for example, I want... Um, I'm performing, performing some medical study, um, and uh, I have, let's say, a mapping of the genome of right. uh, 100,000 people. Now, I, don't, I want to perform statistics and I want to you know, learn things about this data that, that requires some computation, but I don't have the computational power to do it. But at the same time, I, don't, I also don't want to just publish this. this, this there might be sensitive information mm -hmm. present in this, in, this, uh, in this data, so what I could do, I could just encrypt them send the ciphertext to a server that does the computation for me, then returns it back and get the output of the computation. Okay. That's, yeah. that's maybe like the prototypical application mm -hmm. of, of this kind yeah. of technology. People, you can do it. I mean, in, again, in principle, yeah, 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 yeah. That then there's all sorts of challenges to do it concretely, but, but in principle you can do it. And that's, that's you know, what, yeah. one thing that, that... It seems like anyone that studies cryptography or something it has so much power because you can do things that so many other people, normal people, the general public just doesn't understand how to do, right? Well, I mean, it's not so much that that I can do things, <laughs> it's just we are studying them. Yeah. And, uh, uh, um, and, you know, to one extent we understand them, but... Yeah, exactly, but, you understand them. But, you know, so there are multiple layers to understanding so there is again understanding something on a mathematical level and then understanding something on the system level. right those are different, different. Mm -hmm. I see. there are, in fact there are actually very few people that do understand them both oh and, okay interesting and so 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 sometimes there are like there's maybe the more theory community that's focused on the math or yeah it's not 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 always true right there's a lot of exchange mm -hmm. but i'm just saying that you know maybe there is not this one person that has in his brain, on their right. brain, the entire field of yeah. cryptography. It's more like collective knowledge. Okay, I see. Um, so, like I mentioned before, so cryptography seems connected to cryptocurrency, right? Because it, it is. Cryptocurrency is all based on cryptography. Right. When so, you transfer um, money. So I think it's maybe a bit unfair for for. For cryptocurrency to sort of classify it as a subfield of cryptography, I think cryptography is something that is used in cryptocurrencies. Okay. And it's needed. Yeah. But there is there are also other aspects of cryptocurrencies which are not maybe problems which are inherently related to cryptography. For example, um, you know, there is a lot of aspects of cryptocurrencies that covers distributed systems. That's like another discipline of computer science that is not maybe, I mean, it's intersecting with cryptography, but it's not really not. the core of, um, um, yeah. So cryptocurrency is actually a pretty, pretty interesting example because it's something that, you know, sort of came out of the blue. Yeah. Um, and if you ask researchers, they would say, oh, we invented it 50 years ago. Yeah. Uh, if you if you if you ask practitioners, you say, oh, but nobody knew anything, and then it came Bitcoin, right? So so it's a little it's a little uh, it's a little strange how this thing developed, but yeah. So that that's something that you know clearly had an impact in in in, in the world for better or worse, right? Yeah. And so that's something we also study. So do do you like do a, think a lot about cryptocurrency, or is that just something that? No, we do, we do, we do think a lot about cryptocurrencies. So I mean, also, I don't know, make the transactions. 
the most safe as possible or yeah so so okay one thing is that um, security is not m most of the time is not a there is no you know gray scale of security like yeah. most of the times it's a you're or not okay <laughs> oh really yeah yeah so oh I, I would have always thought it was like the spectrum um, like things are more secure less secure not really like I, okay maybe i'm oversimplifying but like we, you, we are used to think about the following so once you define your cryptographic primitive so your crypto, like an encryption scheme let's yeah. say then it's either secure or insecure. There is uh -huh. no such thing as a half secure scheme. Yeah. So yeah. your data is either hidden or not. Yeah. There is no you know half hidden, right? So maybe that's that's what I'm saying. Of course, you can define different security model, and then maybe in that sense you can say it's more secure. Yeah. Maybe maybe we're going and no, no, into, that's fine. That's into, fine. into a rabbit that's hole. That's fine. That's but fine. yeah, yeah. Um, I forgot what I was saying. Um, I said cryptocurrency, um, kind of like if, if you guys work a lot with cryptocurrency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so thinking about the problems of cryptocurrency. Okay, and then how to improve it. And then I was being annoying with the, with the, secu <laughs> with the, with the security. security. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so okay, so so without being pedantic, we'll, we'll kind of <laughs> right? So so yeah, yeah. So we do maybe maybe a problem that that is maybe we are actually looking at is how to make transaction faster. Oh, right, yeah. So I don't know if you, how much you know, maybe I'll, I'll say something you already know, but I'll say it anyway. But that's good because it could be that listeners don't know. Good. And it could also be a big chance that I don't know. Good. So, 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 you know, to, to do a transaction in, 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 a, in a cryptocurrency is, is a little different from the classical settings where you sort of contact your bank, your bank updates some register or whatever. And then the transaction is done, right? Yeah. It's a little bit different because there are like parties interacting in in a quote unquote distributed sense. Though so some so someone is sitting in, in Germany, some other people is sitting in, in Japan, or whatever. So they have to sort of agree on a consistent view. Like, like if if I'm making a transaction, it shouldn't be the case that 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 I just made it for one party. It should be all they should all agree on the transactions that that. That have been made, so that's sort of the, okay. so. Imagine we we want to keep like a note a notebook of transactions, and our note notebook should always contain the same data, even yeah. though we are sitting in different rooms. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. So so that's that's the problem. Yeah. Wait, um, is this the like the ledger or? That's 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 the you can think of it as the ledger, except okay. that you know the ledger is an abstract concept, and uh, there's no such thing as the one ledger. It's you know. Okay. A collective knowledge between yeah. different people, but like abstractly, you can think of it as the ledger. Yeah. Because there is a protocol that allows these people to agree on what the what the ledger is. Yeah. Right. 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 Okay. So, but but it's an abstract concept. It's not mm -hmm. something that is written somewhere physically. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's more like again, it's more like um, like maybe the, the 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 analogy is like the two of us have some notebooks. I keep track of half of the half of the people. You keep track of the other half, and then. You know, when we put them together, they form the ledger. So yeah. That, that's sort of, but, you know, separately, if we sit in different they rooms, they, they don't, right? Yeah. And, and again, like, really the problem, which is called a consensus problem, is to make sure that we don't do inconsistent things. For example, if a transaction has happened for me, then the same transaction should have happened also for you. It mm -hmm. shouldn't be the case that, you know, according to me, party A, Sent five dollars to party B, and according to you, nothing has happened. So yeah, because then then we're in trouble, right? Did, yeah. did this happen or not? Yeah, right. Um, and uh, yeah, so that then this procedure to agree on something, this the consensus problem, that turns out to be quite computationally expensive. Like it's it's an it's an interactive it's a protocol with a lot of communication a lot of rounds, so people have to wait for everybody to respond and so on. Again, I'm, I'm completely oversimplifying, but, but that protocol are, is typically expensive so in yeah. terms of, you have to wait yeah. for this to happen. And uh, I'm forgetting exactly the Bitcoin rate, the transaction rate, but I think it's, it's something like every 10 minutes there is. Oh. There is so, so you can think of this protocol as taking maybe conservatively 
taking 10 minutes. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a long time. And yeah. computing 10 minutes is, is an eternity. Right? Yeah. So, so the question is, um, can you do it faster than exactly. 10 minutes? And, you know, the, 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 like a, a credit card transaction does not take 10 minutes. Mm. It would be very problematic if every time I pay with my credit card, I have to wait 10 minutes. Exactly. It would, be, it would create problems. So, so one thing that we, are, that we are looking at is how we can use cryptography to make this process faster. So there is no, maybe, maybe you should think of it, what we're doing in, in that space, you should think of it like this. Um, there are things, there are some transactions for which we actually don't, you don't need to update the ledger. For example, you know, uh, I pay you coffee, but I don't need to, to store this transaction as long as maybe I trust you that you will pay me the coffee. Mm. That's sort of the idea, except that I don't want to trust you, right? And, and vice versa. And that's exactly where cryptography helps, avoiding trusting, needing to trust other users, while at the same time not going through the expensive protocol that would actually write this information mm -hmm. on, the on what we called earlier the ledger. So, and, 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 and that's really, you know, the kind of cryptography that we are developing here, among other things, it, it, it's used to make these processes uh, uh, faster, make them more secure, yeah. <laughs> secure in the, sense that, <laughs> in the sense that they have better security properties. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so that's maybe our but angle. To aren't that. cryptocurrencies super secure now? Because I think like, Every, because of the kind of like this open public ledger, right? Like everyone, all the transactions have to fit. Right. So um, again, when maybe maybe let's try let's try to be an absolute a bit more precise about yeah. what, what you mean by security. Yeah. So so the question, I guess maybe you are thinking of um, someone trying to you know, steal money from. Exactly. You. Good. So yeah. So. In that sense, empirically, it has shown to be difficult to do this, yeah. but it's not impossible. Like people, people yeah. you know, under certain conditions have done this, and there are there are multiple points of failures where where things can go wrong. But in general, I would say yeah, the, the, that that's a pretty solid, empirically solid, solid architecture. Yeah. But but again, there is also not just one cryptocurrency. There is the right. different design and so on. Um, and they obey sort of different different principles. So so to an extent they are quote unquote secure, but, but again it also depends what you mean by, by by secure. Yeah. Gosh, I'm so thrown off by the security <laughs> how it, I that yeah, I think I think we are very pedantic because you have to when you work for a while in this area, yeah. you have to be very precise. Really? When you define when something is secure or not. And you know, it's, it's the kind of decision that seems silly, but it makes yeah. a lot of difference. Yeah. And things become, if you want to do things properly, they, you know. Yeah. So, so with security, so either something secure or not secure? According to a definition. Right. So then cryptocurrency, is it secure or not secure? Well, you know, according to some definition, it is secure. And according to others, it's, it's not secure. Not, yeah, no, okay. not, not very helpful, maybe. But, right, but, I, I, I guess I... But, but, you know, like, ultimately, the arbiter is the following. Is empirically secure or not? Like, yeah. is the actual system working? It's, I think it's working reasonably well. Yeah. So that's maybe okay. the, the ultimate arbiter of, uh, yeah. of security. Yeah. But what about, like, um, on my phone, right. you know, um, there's a lot of talk about people t like having a lot of access to my data without me actually having shared my data, right? Um, sure. So are, is that, an, that, so the internet's not secure? <laughs> Depends what you mean. Oh, okay. So, sorry, sorry. Um, um, it, so this is nothing to do with cryptocurrency or? No, no, this, no, this, no. Oh, it's this different is different, thing. yeah. Good, 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 good. I'm just, I'm, I'm just curious to see also, how you know what are systems that are secure, what are systems that are not secure, and then how does your work in trying to make something secure play yeah. a role? Right. So I think maybe a big challenge in these very large systems is that they are huge. Yeah. So it's very difficult, if not impossible, for us to think about them 
we don't yeah. know what's happening. Like, yeah. we, nobody knows what's happening in this system. So it, even people that build this system, there is no one yeah. person that knows what's going on in the entire system. So that's the big challenge of this. this. And then modeling security in the system, it, you have to start, you know, if you want to model something secure, you have to, at the very least, being able to describe what this thing is, right? And we are not able to, because we don't know all the moving parts and so on. Mm -hmm. So what, so how do people do with this? How do people deal with this? Well, people try to abstract away, you know, small, break things down in small building blocks, right? For example, like one small building blocks could be an encryption scheme, right? So, mm -hmm. so that's something that, you know, it's fairly easy to talk about. And it's something that, you know, it seems useful, right? It seems yeah. really useful. And, uh, and then, but then the question is, how does it, you know, how does it, how does this thing behave when you put it inside of a larger system? That's mm -hmm. a very difficult question. Yeah. And that's something people have studied a lot. Uh, but, but again, it's very difficult. So what, what people have done, for example, they have developed uh, automated tools to reason about this large system automatically. So as humans, we are not very good at keeping all this information inside of our brains, but machines are better than us, mm. so we can use them. But that's maybe not what I'm doing, but uh, but maybe what other colleagues of mine are doing here. Yeah. Um, um, right. So so. Like saying that something is secure is it's it's a very difficult question to answer. And you know we we have like our small building blocks and we have we're we are fairly confident that they work, but then how they sort of compose together and how they behave as part of the larger system, it also depends how you put them together. I mean, I mean for example, think of encryption, right? So yeah. encryption really requires you to keep this key private, but maybe your system just publishes it as an accident. Mm -hmm. right? And then, of course, there's nothing we can do. Right. Uh, as a cryptographer, as, yeah. as a system engineer, that you can develop your system in such a way that these things doesn't happen, that there are safeguards and so on. Yeah. But again, these things are extremely complicated to reason about. Uh, there is no, as I said, there is no one person that has in his head all in in their head all the systems in the world. Yeah. Right? It's, so it's just impossible. So we really have to try to this, to break this problem into smaller pieces and reason about the. This, this, you know, small thing that we can fit in our brain. Mm -hmm. That's that's maybe. Okay. I don't know if that answers your question. Probably it doesn't. And um, I guess I'm like, I mean, it doesn't matter. I guess um, it's funny how you know you you throw around security or secure systems. Just the, you know the term you just throw it around. We use it all the time. Yes. But then there seems to be like a very clear definition and very clear way in which you should be using that. No, but, but, but we use ill-defined concepts all the time. So okay, okay. So, 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 it's, fact, so it's okay. We talk about consciousness and, uh, right. and, and thoughts and, and reasoning. This, these are not well-defined concepts. So, so it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so maybe, 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 you know, I'm overly, overly pedantic. On right, this right. But, uh, um, so back to cryptocurrencies. Back to cryptocurrencies. So as we were talking about the whole cryptography, do, do you know a lot about like how cryptocurrencies work? Um, well, uh, I, I did study, you know, the basic principles of cryptocurrencies, if you're asking me about Yeah, it, can, can you explain them to me? Right. Um, good. So, so... Just because I, I've tried really hard to learn about it, and it's, it, I don't know, I find it very hard to understand. And I don't think I'm the only one that doesn't understand cryptocurrencies. Okay, okay. So, again, I'll... I'll Maybe I'll try to give like a bit of an abstract yeah. explanation about the problem and then how they, what's the basic principle. And maybe let me make a disclaimer now that things are more complicated yeah. than I'm going to, and maybe I'm misrepresenting, but I'll do it anyway and yeah. hopefully people will not get offended. <laughs> so um, here's the thing, here's the problem that we are trying to solve, which is related to what we were talking about earlier. So it starts from this problem. We want to maintain a system in a distributed sense, which is consistent. And the system is actually a you know a system of transactions. So so think about it, think about it the following. If there was just one ledger, you should think of it as like a bank or something like this. Mm -hmm. It's very easy, you just have one notebook, 
you can write all the transactions in one notebook. Okay. Yeah. And um, and you know then everybody can just come and look at this notebook and everything is fine and easy because it's quote unquote centralized. There is only one notebook. Now, you know the original motivation behind cryptocurrencies and, and, and all this uh, this technology was to get rid of this one central authority that controls all the transaction and to sort of distribute the trust among different people in the globe. It can be whoever, right? So again, maybe let's, let's try to think of it as an abstract level, so without, without talking about politics too much. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, uh, so that's, that's the problem. And now the question is, how do you make sure that all the notebooks that we keep around um, they are in a uh, consistent state. So that's the consensus problem. Mm -hmm. Right, which we talked about which before. Talked mm -hmm. about. Yeah. And that's essentially what cryptocurrencies help to solve. Yeah. Cry cryptocurrency is nothing more than essentially what, what we called earlier a ledger, where we just store the movements of the, of the coins, but there is, like, at least in principle, there's not much more than that. It's, it's really just this. So really the question is, Let's say that two people that participate into this system, they come up with two notebooks which are inconsistent. Mm -hmm. Who is right? Hmm. Not clear, right? Yeah. Um, so, so, and when you're trying to design, so this is, the, this is a fundamental problem that, that people face in this. And when you're trying to design such system, you can say, okay, well, just flip a coin and, uh, and one of the two will be right. So here's the solution. Okay, so you could try to implement this, but then you quickly realize that, wait a minute, what if, what if one of these persons is actually a, a corrupted user, is a malicious player, right? So you have to think in this, in this terms, mm -hmm. right? Um, what if this person is a corrupted user? You know, if I flip a coin with 50% probability, I will, he will be right, and he will maybe forge a transaction, like steal some coins, or like pretend that something you know, that happened did not happen, so he gets back his money, so he can do all sorts of crazy things. We don't want to do that. So yeah, so fr flipping a random coin is, is not a good idea. So, so, so let's, let's take this idea and throw it in the trash bin. That's, but then how do we do it? And then people say, okay, well, you know, we could, uh, we could uh, design a voting system, okay? Like for example, you know, all the participants come together and they vote who yeah. they think is right. And, you know, hopefully there will not be ties most of the time, and then if there is a tie, you run it again, whatever. There you go. Uh, this, is, this is one system. And I said, hmm, okay, that, that sounds, sounds like more, more robust ideas. And, and so the reason why this idea is more robust is because now the attacker needs to corrupt not only one node, but the majority of the nodes, mm. right? By node, I mean a, like a participant in the system. Because now he has to win the election. Right. right. So you have to sort of, this is a much more complicated task, right? You know, maybe my, my smartphone has a virus, my smartphone has a virus, but, you know, all the smartphone of Europe have a virus, maybe yeah. not, right? Yeah. I mean, so, so it's, now it becomes much more, much more robust. This is the first idea. It turns out that this doesn't work quite yet. Yeah. And the problem is that, uh, 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 am I, am I going yeah. I, to technical? Or no, 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 for sure not. No, this is all understandable. All, all good. Fantastic. Yeah. So, so again, like maybe let's take a step back. We are trying to solve this consensus problem. Now we we devise the system with voting, okay. But one problem is okay. So now, how do you decide who participates to this vote? Yeah. So that's the hard question, right? And uh, that this is a very difficult question because because you know you don't know. Like as a human, you can just say, okay, you know, if you're a human, you can participate, right? But machines are not recognizable. So in fact, I could just take my machine and spawn a billion mach machines out of it by just having, I don't know, a billion parallel processors. Now, suddenly I, am, I have a much more voting power than, you know, someone with just one laptop. Yeah. So that's also not good, right? Yeah. So that means that an attacker can just like buy a very expensive computer uh, or just, you know, uh, uh, impersonate a lot of identities and so on, and that, that's not good. Uh, so you need a way to sort of make sure that whoever is participating in this election is actually, well, 
an actual entity, right? So uh, ideally you want to ensure that it's a human, but over the internet it's hard to to, to transfer humans, so you, you you can only transfer data. Yeah. So but surely the, through through data you can tell if it's a human or a robot, right? No, no, it, it's it's hard to say. It's hard. It's hard oh. to say. So also also you want something that doesn't require so first of all, too much you, effort. You also don't want well, something that is automated. Right, right, yeah. So, and, you know, maybe us, we can recognize, but you don't want a, a human to, to do this process every time. Like yeah, no, I agree, yeah. So then, then, then it becomes a question of whether a machine can understand that it's an yeah. argument. They are not good at this. Yeah, yeah. Very easy to, very easy to fool. Yeah. So how do they do it? Well, the, the sort of the idea of, the, 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 like the one idea maybe at the base of Bitcoin is that um, if you have done some computation, it means that you invested some energy in this process, and that sort of grants you voting rights. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's maybe the idea. And now the point is that, you know, you cannot just spawn 100 billion machines, right? But you really have to do some work to be able to participate in this mm. election. That's maybe, yeah. maybe you've heard of like proof of work, that's, that's the one thing. Okay, I've not heard of it. Not before, heard, but, but, but whatever, okay. So that's how maybe the principle behind the consensus protocol okay. of Bitcoin. Okay, right. And this is not the only method, there are other methods. But really the problem that they are sort of trying to solve is the same. So how do you ensure that people that actually participate in a particular decision, yeah. they are people who are invested in this network mm -hmm. and not just you know, I don't know if you know what, what are, yeah, like, do you know like, what are botnets? Botnets are just, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, like machines that don't exist. Yeah, right. There was also like huge talk that, like, I mean, on Twitter, for example, there was those bots, but also that in the Russian, in the American elections, like with Russia involvement, that it was all for bots. Yeah, you see, it's, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a mess. Yeah, so, exactly. And we want to avoid this kind of, like, you know, the, the bots like taking decisions and, and yeah. so you want yeah, to yeah. really make sure that there is something behind every entity that takes a decision yeah. and the way Bitcoin does it is by forcing them to do some calculation. Right. And it's like, it's a quote unquote expensive calculation. Is this like related to Bitcoin mining? Yeah, that's exactly it. Okay, so this is, so basically you have to be a Bitcoin miner to... Uh, to take the decision. To, okay, okay. I, I'm oversimplifying yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot. But yeah. again, I'm trying to sort of abstract the principle and then from that, you know, how to actually implement it, it's, it's something that, that, that requires a, lot, a yeah. lot of different ideas, but maybe this is sort of the core principle. Yeah, right, right. Okay. How does the blockchain play a role in this? So a blockchain is nothing more but sort of subsequent snapshot of the books, of this ledger that, that, oh, okay. that you are. Okay. That you are. So, you know, what was the state of the system at time one, then what happened, like the transactions that happened, okay. and then transactions that happened afterwards and so on. So those are what, what you would call the blocks of the blockchain. Right. And right. Um, you have to make sure that, uh, you know, that, that you can safely backtrack and go forward when yeah. you're sort of reading the transaction. The attacker should not be able to sort of... Yeah lead you off to a different to okay a different and so through the blockchain technology you just kind of i don't know like regulate everything you make sure that everything is following its order. so so that's more like i mean, i would say maybe that the, the blockchain is sort of more the the uh, uh data structure yeah. that we use to implement this yeah. uh, this quote-unquote ledger so the ledger is stored in the form of a sequence of blocks yeah again oversimplifying, omitting a lot of details, there are different ways to do it, blah, 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 but that's, that's the principle. Okay, okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. And so, so all cryptocurrencies all have a blockchain, right? Um, like they all need a blockchain. Well, uh, I think, I think not necessarily, like there are some cryptocurrencies, that, there might be some cryptocurrencies that use different data yeah. structures, but I think the most like popular the ones, they all use a blockchain. Okay. But, but maybe the blockchain is sort of, I don't know, think of the, what's a good analogy for this? So, so there's a, you know, there's a principle, 
which you know has nothing to do with the blocks and so on. Yeah. But that's the, then there is also the way you implement it, which is uses blocks. And the, yeah. But you could think of a system that doesn't use blockchains. Okay. But so then yeah. Um, there's a huge like rise in kind of government-based cryptocurrencies. Yes. Um, because I guess we, we started off with Bitcoin and all that. That was They, they were all company-run, right? Um, well, I mean, I wouldn't say company-run. It's more like community. Or, yeah, exactly. Whereas now, I mean, you see it with the Chinese, Huan, and then also in Europe, there's a lot of people that are saying that they want to introduce central bank digital currencies in the future. And there's a lot of research being done in that. Yeah. How are they different to, let's say, Bitcoin, for example? Yeah, so um, I'm not, you know, an expert. Yeah. Here, so I'm, not, I'm not sure what, what's going on at that level. Yeah. But um, I mean, you can consider, I, I think it is a slightly different settings in the sense that, uh, um, so the sort of environment where Bitcoin was developed, again, from a technical perspective, yeah. is the environment which is fully distributed. You don't know anything about any other user, right? Anybody in principle can join the network and start yeah. mining, so taking part of this yeah. decision. So you don't really make any distinction between, you know, it, it is someone from a company, it is a private individual. That's so it's, it's all anonymous, right? That's a, that's a different, oh. different, okay. different question. I'm just saying that, so maybe I don't want to go into an right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. We cannot talk about that yeah, later. Yeah. I just saying there is no entrance barrier, so yeah. like, you know, I, I as an individual can can start mining Bitcoin now. You know, the question is whether I would be effective at doing that. It's a mm. different different question, but like in principle, I can go. Now, when you start talking about you know banks implementing their own internal cryptocurrencies, I think it's a slightly different setting because now, as an individual, can I join this 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 system? I would presume not, right? Yeah. So then, then you start. You really are talking about a slightly different model, right? Okay. And uh, to, now you're asking. You can ask. You know, do they need a cryptocurrency, do, or could they just do? You know, with a different structure. I don't know. But also, just like uh, from the from a technology technological point of view, would they just work in the same way, where you also have the blockchain? Um, I guess you wouldn't really mine anything though because you don't need to. Yeah, I would say it really depends on the settings that you're considering. If you're, for example, if you really have a you know a way to distinguish uh, parties which are taking part to this operation, yeah. and you can clearly distinguish who is corrupted and who is not, yeah. then you probably don't need this mechanism. Yeah. But you know, it really depends on the kind of attacker model and. Uh, the kind of uh, uh, you know trust that you're willing to put in nodes and so on. So it, right. I don't think there is sort of a I don't think there is a silver bullet of uh, you know oh here here you have blockchains and here you have like centralized currency. Yeah. It's more like a set of techniques, a set of uh, 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 yeah mathematical data structures and and, 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 and and cryptographic tools that you can use to improve your systems in certain ways. Yeah. But it's not just like a monolithic thing mm -hmm. that, that, that you control. I mean you can do it of course. You can you yeah. know you, you can you can take you know the same code that Bitcoin has and, and transport it to you know the, the European central bank. But is it really useful? I yeah. don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to ask this question. And so if we go back to just like the way uh, cryptocurrency like the basics of it, mm -hmm. what we were talking about before with the miners and stuff. Um so is it all anonymous? Like all the transactions that are done are all fully anonymous? Good, good. Um, that's a very difficult question. Yeah. And uh, I think by now it's pretty well understood that for Bitcoin the answer is no. Okay. So that, you know, you don't have your name written on the Bitcoin network. Yeah. But you have an identifier which is fixed for you. Right? So it doesn't have to do anything with your identity. but. In the Bitcoin network, when you join the network, you have a so-called public key. And that public key is, you know, think of it as your digital identity. Mm -hmm. With quotation marks, right? Um, now, 
it is anonymous in the sense that in principle I don't know who is behind this key but it's not anonymous in the sense that I can essentially trace where transactions are, are going from which account to the other okay. and that already gives me a lot of information yeah um, not always possible there are ways to sort of mitigate this okay. and there are other cryptocurrencies with which employ maybe more sophisticated techniques that actually allow you to hide who is sending money to whom. Right, because I thought Bitcoin was like, or cryptocurrency was fully um, traceable. Like every transaction that you do is essentially traceable. In Bitcoin, that's the case. Yeah. But there are. But there are cryptocurrencies where it's not. Yeah. But you can prove it. Right. Using cryptography. That's again what cryptography. Is. But it, but but in some cases you wouldn't be able. Oh right, as in you can prove that it's not traceable. Exactly. You so, with ah. Okay, so okay, so that's okay. a big difference. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Between you know, so in Bitcoin you know, maybe the situation is that most of the time you can trace. Mm -hmm. But if you really care about anonymity, are you happy with yeah. that? Probably not. You you want to be anonymous all the time. Right. right yeah. So, but there's a lot of danger of having something that's. No, no, of course. Of completely non-traceable, yeah. Like every technology, well, not everyone, but every, every technology, like many technology, of course, it, yeah. it, it, can be, it can be dangerous. Interesting, yeah. Um, yeah, because there's also, like, I mean, in, in the recent three years, I think there's been a lot of scandals of companies, uh, I think a lot to do also with crypto exchange, but mm -hmm. that have just, you know, been involved in money laundering and all that. So it's right. very hard to put trust in a cryptocurrency based system or just a cryptocurrency yeah. when you don't understand how it even works yeah that 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 is true but i would say i, I would say this is more of a societal problem yeah we also don't understand how our smartphone works i don't understand how smart i don't understand how my tv works i still i still look at it right right, so right. i i think maybe maybe you know when the technology becomes mature enough then there is sort of sort of degree of trust that starts building up, and then and then and now it's a mess, yeah. right? I mean, you see scandals every. Yeah, every it, see, it seems it seems like a bit of a mess right now. But, but I think that's it's very early stages. Yeah, but I think that that that's more of a societal problem, or well, problem. It's a societal effect. Yeah. Rather yeah. than rather than a technological. Um, right. So I don't know if that's something we can solve with crypto, for example. Yeah, yeah with cryptography. <laughs> with cryptography, yeah. 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 So, but okay, maybe, yeah. I don't know, who knows? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much uh, for this conversation. Thank you. Um, it was confusing. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like there's a lot of information here that just needs to click, you know? And I, I really appreciate also the way you simplified everything down. And I know that especially as an academic and as a researcher, it's hard to do that because you're like, I'm missing out so many key information. That, but I do think it's really important because if you want to get more people to understand what you're actually doing, you have to simplify it down. Yeah. And so I, I really appreciate what you did. I know it wasn't easy. Sorry for being pedantic about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no <laughs> worries. Security. It's important so that everyone knows you know, how, how the right way is to talk about things. So yeah. thank you a lot. Thank you so much. That's it. Thank you all so much for listening. If you would like to learn more about Giulio and his research, you can check out his website, and you can also check out his webpage on the MPI for Security and Privacy website. The links are in the description below. And if you like our podcasts, please make sure to follow us on our Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram page. Thanks again for listening. Bye. Officer Magazine, the podcast is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net Science Communication Group known as the Officer Magazine. The intro outro music is composed by Serena Thrankumar, and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizo. If you have any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspring.podcast at phdnet.mpg.de. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye.